Good, I think we can start. Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture series on advanced machine learning for physics, science and artificial scientific discovery. Before we go on, I just want to point out that I'm streaming this live on YouTube, which also means it will be later available on my YouTube channel. This is also good for the students who cannot make this particular time slot. So I do hope that everyone is okay with that. If not, then you might log out and just watch the recordings later. Okay, so if everyone is okay with that, uh, welcome again. My name is Florian Marquardt. I'm at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen in Germany and at the local university, which is the Friedrich Alexander University Erlangen Nuremberg. Now this lecture series is supposed to take place twice a week. So Monday and Wednesday for 90 minutes each and always starting at six o'clock uh, German time running until 7.30. Before we really get started with the contents, let me point out that uh, all the information you can find on the website. So on the website uh, of this course, uh, which I think you know, because otherwise you couldn't register for the Zoom link, you will find a link to a discussion group that I just set up in which uh, you can ask questions and maybe also help each other uh, in the discussions about the topics of the lecture. Then there is also a link to a GitHub code repository. Uh, for now, there's only a single notebook there, but as the co co course progresses, I will try to make sure that whenever we are discussing examples or I see some uh, useful piece of code, I can put it on the repository. And I also welcome uh, contributions if you think you have a nice example. Then on the website, you will also find links to the literature that I uh, will um, refer to during the course. There's a link to the YouTube channel on which this is being streamed and where all the videos are being archived. And then we will also have homework problems. So here I have uh, my senior collaborator, Vittorio Piano, to help me. Uh, these homework problems, we think we will post them each Wednesday uh, simply on the website. And uh, I believe they will consist on, of, say, approximately two problems of a more analytical kind. Uh, one simpler and the other maybe a little bit more involved, and a third problem that uh, deals a little bit more with programming. I should say that uh, this particular lecture is not centered on the programming. Some of you know that I gave another machine learning for physicists lecture course already several times, and it's also available uh, on the web on my YouTube channel and has a website. Uh, this website is uh, there is a link to that on the website of the current course. So that was designed as a more hands-on tutorial introduction with all the programming tricks that you might use for the basics of neural networks. So if you uh, feel you may lack a little bit of background in this direction, I really invite you to watch at least the first few lectures of that other more basic course and look at some of the notebooks that were part of that course to get started on the programming. In the present course, uh, we will be more interested in the conceptual and mathematical part that also allows us to move more quickly towards the really, really interesting stuff. And so that's why it's called the advanced machine learning lecture. But I still promise that I will make sure, especially in the beginning, to repeat at least briefly all the material uh, that you will need. Okay, so with regard to the homework, again, will be posted each Wednesday, and then a week later, we will post uh, at least some hints uh, that should enable you to solve it if you haven't been able to solve it by then. But you're also very welcome, please, to discuss the homework problems uh, on the discussion group among you. Then at the end of the uh, winter term, so in February, uh, there will be an exam for the local students of the Friedrich Alexander University uh, for them to get their credit points. This is a 10 ECTS uh, point course. And um, I will put up the uh, tentative date of this written exam 
uh, relatively soon on the website. It already exists and uh, we have registered for that. Um, so that will be on the website. Now for all the other international students that are joining, and there are many of them, uh, while you cannot get an official exam at uh, our university, what we can do is something we have done successfully before in that other course, namely uh, we can define as the course progresses some mini project which uh, you actually select something creative that has to do with the lecture series with the topics that we discuss. Uh, so you propose uh, something small uh, it, and then write a program or maybe even do some analytical theory, I don't know. Um, and then at the very end, after the last lecture, we will arrange for a special Zoom meeting where you can very briefly, where you can very briefly uh, within five minutes uh, present your results. And if you then, um, uh, if you do this and supply a small written report, which is just two pages, um, I can give you a official certificate on, on the letterhead of the university and the Max Planck Institute. And then depending on your uh, rules at the local university that you are at, uh, maybe you can take this to the Dean of Studies and even get credit points, or at least there is some certificate to prove that you were uh, participating in the lecture. So again, there will be information about this uh, on the website and in the discussion group. Okay. So that I think is all I wanted to say here about the info that is available. And again, I will always post the, the most important things will all be on the website and any announcements will also be put on the discussion group. Okay, so then let's get started with the introduction. And the introduction is basically about explaining the different pieces of the title of this lecture. So it's called Advanced Machine Learning for Physics, Science, and Artificial Scientific Discovery. So the advanced I explained because it's no longer the hands-on tutorial of a very basic course and it's more conceptual and machine learning and introduces advanced concepts. Um, but what about the machine learning? What does machine learning really mean? And so the first thing is that, of course, when we talk of machine what we really mean is a computer. So that's what we mean by a machine. But the more important question is, what does the learning refer to? And so you all know that, of course, computers have been very useful in technology and science for a long time. And the typical way you think about a computer program is that it implements some algorithm. So you have some input X, and you run the algorithm and you get some output y. So in a very simplified mathematical notation, you could say an algorithm is just a function that takes an input and gives you an output. In principle, this input, of course, can be very dimensional. It can be a picture and so on. But there is a definite algorithm that produces an output. Now, if you run this algorithm on one input and then you run it five times on different types of inputs and then you came back to the first input and run it again, what do you expect? Well, of course, you expect that it gives exactly the same answer as you got in the beginning. It will not give a different answer now. There's a slight um, exception to this rule. There are some algorithms that use some stochastic properties. In that case, you would run it several times to confirm that at least the statistics hasn't changed uh, in the meantime. So an algorithm uh, always gives the same answer. And that changes with machine learning, because in machine learning, the idea is you run something once and twice and many times on different inputs. And then if you come back to the first input that you ever gave, you see a different answer. You see a different answer because the machine has learned something. So if we want to write this in the same kind of notation, we would say now the output is no longer just a function of the current input but it's also a function of all the experience that the machine has acquired. Because that is what learning is about. Now, to put this more precisely, there will be some memory in the machine and the output at the current time will depend on the state of the memory. 
And it is this memory state that depends on all the prior experience. It may not be that you have stored every little detail of all the experience, every little picture that you have ever seen, for example, but what is usually happening is that you distill the essence of all the experience you have in order to improve this overall function and hopefully give better answers uh, than before. And typically this means you're improving the answers with respect to a certain task. So you're trying to learn from experience for a certain task. So you improve over time with respect to a certain task. This task can be very narrow, but it can also be extremely general. So the input may contain even a task description. So all of that is still open, but at least you improve over time and the answers are no longer the same. Of course, this has many benefits. Uh, it means that you don't need a human to design this algorithm. And in particular, this means even if no human has ever come up with an algorithm for this particular problem where you don't even know how you would design this, uh, possibly you could still find such a function from experience. Okay, so that's good. So you don't need a programmer to design a complicated algorithm. Of course, you still need to put in some work. Um, so what you do need to design is a general algorithm. But that algorithm is not specific to the particular task. Rather, this is a general algorithm that teaches us how to update the memory state and how to construct this overall more complicated function that depends on both the current input and the experience. But the trick is that this general algorithm uh, is not very task specific, but it's rather an algorithm that you can uh, use to build such a learning machine uh, for many different tasks. So you would say it's a general learning algorithm. And so the task of us using machine learning uh, to apply to science and technology has shifted. It has shifted from looking at a very specific task and designing an algorithm for that task to rather designing very powerful general learning algorithms um, and then maybe slightly adapting them uh, according to the knowledge we have about specific tasks. Also, since learning from experience means uh, you learn according to the particular examples you see, it becomes important that you collect many of these examples or that you choose very carefully in which order you present the examples. So suddenly all of this becomes important, which is of course completely unimportant for a usual algorithm. Okay. So that's machine learning. And then we said advanced machine learning for physics and science. And so that brings me um, to the general overview of where these days machine learning is being used. Often machine learning uh, using neural networks, and we will talk a lot about neural networks, but not necessarily the field of machine learning is of course broader than that. So it has revolutionized in the last decade or so, uh, both science and technology. In technology, uh, there are many, many examples, but just to start with one, uh, you would have the example of um, self-driving cars and robotics, and there are even different aspects here where machine learning becomes important. It's important for the image recognition that you may need for a self-driving car or for a robot, uh, which has to orient itself. But also uh, machine learning can help to find the right strategies to react to the observations. Then there are things like um, speech recognition. So you get an audio signal and you want to listen to it and understand which words it corresponds to. There is things like image re restoration. So you have a very, very crappy image and you want to find out what would be the corresponding 
pure color image uh, that it represented once uh, in a time. So uh, what has been done is actually full black and white movies have been restored in this way and turned into color movies. Then there's of course the large domain of natural language processing. And uh, this has applications, for example, in text understanding. This is one uh, example where uh, people go through a large database of descriptions of movies and they want to find out whether this particular review of the movie is more positive or more negative. You could have question answering systems like a chatbot. Uh, you tell it some things and then it can answer. You could uh, use it to extract useful information from say scientific articles, uh, extract some of the hard facts that are described in natural language in these articles. Then there's the whole domain of text translation. So um, that has also made very rapid progress in past years and we will see some of the tools that uh, are needed for text translation. And then of course there's an area which may not have immediate use say in engineering applications but it's still very useful uh, for the progress in the field and that would be uh, playing games maybe many of you have heard about a uh, computer being better than uh, the best human players and playing the board game of go and in the meantime also many other games okay so that's a machine learning for technology and then of course it's natural that it's also very useful for science so again, if we come back to image uh, recognition and image processing, there's the whole area of microscopy. So once you have these microscopy images, maybe you want to do image segmentation. So this is what I'm showing here in this little sketch. Uh, you want the computer to automatically understand which pieces represent the cells and which pieces represent the cell nucleus and these biological cells. Or you can also do uh, image improvement so you might have a low resolution image, but you are really interested in a high resolution version. And you can have training beforehand on many pairs of high resolution, low resolution images. And later on, you only represent, uh, you only present to the network, the low resolution version and it will uh, spit out the high resolution one. There's the whole uh, field of numerical simulations, for example, of many particle dynamics, many interacting particles uh, that move around, and you can try to speed up these simulations. Um, that's one thing that you can do these days. Um, you can look at phase transitions. So if this is a magnetic material and the two colors represent uh, magnetic spin up and down, uh, then you can train a neural network to look at such a picture and understand which phase of the matter is, is it in ferromagnetic, paramagnetic. You can use it for control uh, in quantum systems. So this is one thing we have been working on in our group. So you can ask, can the computer invent a new quantum error correction strategy and then apply it to an actual quantum device. Uh, I will come back to the question in a moment. And then just to finish off this little list of examples in the field of science, if you move to chemistry, you can ask, okay, I have these two molecules, will they bind to each other? And how strongly will they bind to each other? Will they react with each other? And that's particularly important in medicine where you want to know whether a particular molecule um, is active in terms of activating or shutting off some enzyme or something like this. And then finally, because it uh, has uh, become uh, popular recently, there's uh, progress in, the ex in extremely hard domains of um, large biomolecules, let's say protein folding, where it had been a puzzle for a long time if you are told the atoms inside a protein, what is the final shape that the protein goes into? And again, uh, it helps to have um, neural networks and there has been great success recently. So now there's a first question I see. Uh, so uh, by the way, for questions, it is best to use the chat. Uh, we have good experience with that in the, in the, previous, in the previous lecture. 
but I would uh, hope that you can repost your question actually to everyone so that everyone can see it because otherwise people will not really know which question I'm replying to. So anyway, there's a question which I can read. Uh, I mentioned that we don't set the function f of x for machine learning. But for example, when we train a neural network model, we set specific activation functions in the hidden and output layers. Uh, and we are therefore putting a constraint on it. Uh, yes, that's a good point. So um, as I said, we still have to invent a general learning algorithm. And part of this general learning algorithm will be that we provide a general shape of this function. But it is not very task specific. So uh, you can use the same kind of neural network that you use for image recognition on one type of images uh, to also work on, say, a physics example where you want to uh, feed in some kind of measurements and the output should be the predicted state of a qubit. Maybe you have to slightly change the format of the input and the output, but that's about it. So. You don't need any more task specific inputs. Whereas if you want to design an algorithm like the f of x that I wrote in the first line, then of course you, you need to have a lot of expert knowledge. You need to know exactly how you go about mathematically converting the input to the output. So that's the difference. It's not that you don't do anything anymore, uh, but you put in very, very little task specific knowledge. That's the idea. Okay. And uh, maybe adding to that, uh, in practice, it turns out the best results are probably achieved if you still have some experts on board. Otherwise, you could say, oh, I'm just a computer scientist. Uh, give me your data and I will predict things. But it's still good to have experts on board that can help you select the right data, select the right format of the data, um, and maybe also adjust slightly at least the structure of your machine learning approach uh, to the particular problem at hand. So there's still some human input and we will come back to that, but it's much less than before, I would say. Okay, so much for machine learning and science and technology. Now, Finally, I want to say something about artificial scientific discovery. So what did I mean by that term? And first of all, of course, the artificial refers to scientific discovery being performed by a computer. But first of all, I want to point out that scientific discovery has been aided for a very long time by the use of computers. And these computers have sometimes really led to extremely important insights. This has happened already since the 1950s. And one extremely famous example that I want to mention because it's very nice is this one, a simple chain of particles coupled together via springs. So that was something that um, three rather famous scientists, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam, looked at in the 1950s already when they had available the very first computers. And they sat down and they asked themselves, what is a useful problem in science to apply this computer to? What could we do? And they identified a very nice problem, namely in statistical physics, we always imagine that a system in thermal equilibrium obeys, obeys the Boltzmann distribution. But why is that the case? Yeah, so we have the idea, and this idea had been around already by then, that uh, if you start a physical system in an arbitrary state, then just by the complicated interactions between the particles, it will effectively relax to a thermal equilibrium state. And the only memory of the initial state will be contained in the temperature because the initial energy will set the temperature of the final thermal state that you reach. But that was a conjecture. And it was a conjecture because in the simple models that you could treat analytically, it didn't happen. But the excuse was that if you were to go to more complicated models with complicated nonlinear dynamics, then it would happen. But of course, it's very hard to test if you cannot solve these models analytically. So they went and uh, looked around what, what is the simplest possible nonlinear dynamical system in which we can test this fundamental hypothesis of statistical physics. And they came up with a simple system 
of uh, particles in a chain in one dimension. They are interacting in a nonlinear way. And so the hope was if you just started in an arbitrary state initially, it will eventually, by the complicated nonlinear interactions, relax to a thermal equilibrium state. It turned out it didn't. Yeah, so it, that was a big surprise. The system did not relax to thermal equilibrium. And after some time, people started to understand, aha, this kind of nonlinear dynamics, especially in this one, uh, one dimensional system is much, much more complicated. And this led to the field of solitons and of chaos. And eventually people understood also there's big differences here between one dimensions and higher dimensions where it's much easier to relax to thermal equilibrium. And so it was a qualitative insight that they came up with um, by the help of a computer experiment. And you wouldn't be able to do this experiment with so easily, at least with real particles and springs, simply because in a real experiment, you would have friction and the friction would slow down everything. And that's not what you want for these purposes. You want them to move, to keep moving all the time. So uh, that's an example of an extremely important qualitative insight. Oopsie. So um, let me go back. And then this has expanded. Of course, there's a whole field of nonlinear dynamics, uh, statistical physics, where you say, I know the energy function of my system, but I want to run through all the configurations, let's say, of my magnetic system, calculate the average magnetization of such quantities. And uh, this has then developed to a great degree. You can also look at much larger scales, for example, the whole field of cosmology uh, wouldn't exist in its current shape without the help of uh, very large scale computer simulations of uh, the Newtonian uh, gravitational dynamics of millions of particles. And then there are climate models. So um, you want to basically solve hydrodynamics and even more advanced equations that describe evaporation and so on, uh, on a large scale computer, running them on a large scale computer. There's the whole field of quantum chemistry and materials science. So um, you want to solve the equations of quantum mechanics in order to find out what's the energy of the electrons in some material, um, what will be the equilibrium configuration of this material or this molecule, what chemical reactions might be possible, what are the excited electronic states, what colors does this material have. So for all of that, uh, it's extremely important. Um, then in the domain of high energy physics, you put your quantum field theories on a lattice and run them on supercomputers. And this is how we now know that starting from the fundamental theory of quantum chromodynamics, you can actually to a very good degree of approximation obtain the masses of protons and neutrons. And then uh, there have been very exciting developments like um, uh, the application of computers for automated proofs. So one of the first examples where this was done to some degree uh, was the four color theorem. So that uh, if you take a map and you just want to make sure that you color uh, the different uh, regions in the map so that uh, adjacent regions have different colors, then four colors are sufficient for a planar map. And so there they ran a computer that had to enumerate a large number of different configurations in order to, uh, to do the proof. So. That's definitely examples where the computer does not only give you quantitative uh, statements and where you would already have known the qualitative uh, results, but really where qualitative uh, insights have been obtained by running computers. There's also two other fields that I put a little bit separately here because they are even more connected and quite directly connected already to machine learning techniques that I mentioned in the beginning. So there's the field of data analysis. Obviously, since the earliest computers, uh, they have been used for data analysis in science and technology. So you have some measurement results. You want to fit a function through these results. Uh, and then you go to higher and higher dimensional examples of this. Or maybe you are in, interested in DNA sequences and you want to some, do some statistical analysis uh, or some pattern matching. So for all of this, computers are good. Um, and there, it's very obvious that there's a very small step to, from these um, 
hand-coded fixed statistical algorithms to going towards modeling using machine learning techniques where the computer improves and learns a model by experience. And then there's the domain of optimization where the same thing can be said. So I again give two examples. The first one on the left hand side, this funny structure uh, is supposed to represent a piece of glass that has been shaped in a funny way. And then uh, the yellow lines are electromagnetic waves propagating in this piece of glass. And you want those waves to propagate in a certain way. And people know how to apply computers to optimize the shape of these holes in the piece of glass uh, for the wave propagation to do exactly what you want. So that's uh, one example of optimization. Another example is shown to the right. So this is my sketch of a Stellarator fusion reactor design. So the red lines are the magnetic field lines and the blue lines are the magnetic field coils that generate the magnetic field. And while the design has already been around since the 1950s, I believe, um, the optimization of the precise shape of these very strange looking uh, magnetic coils that has now been taken over by computers. And so again, uh, from here, it's only a very short step uh, towards the use of machine learning techniques. So this is where computers have been useful for more than 50 years now in all of these fields, and they have uh, already yielded very important qualitative insights. But still, still, despite all of this, central steps in science are still being taken by humans. And a typical example would be model building. So you make some observations, you want to model them, you want to build a theory. And this is something that is still typically taken by humans. And to give maybe the most famous and historically the, one of the earliest examples of model building, look at the motion of stars and of planets. Now imagine you're looking at the night sky and it is, I don't know, the year 1600. This is what you would see. So you have lots of stars and you immediately see there's a pattern in the motion of these stars. You see they seem to all revolve around a certain center. And you also see that the stars that are further apart from the center, they move faster. So that's a pattern that you understand. But with time, it becomes a little bit boring to look at this. And then you come up with a model. Why might this pattern result? And you come up with the idea, maybe the stars are really fixed. Maybe I'm on a rotating platform, so to speak. So the Earth is rotating. OK, so that's right. And then you look at the motion a little bit more carefully. As you have already made this first modeling step, now you are looking at things more carefully. And you see that some of the stars behave differently. They are moving in a different way, in a funny way. And you call these stars wanderers, planets. And you put in a lot of effort observing the motion of these planets for a long time, for many years. And you collect hundreds and hundreds of pages of notebooks of observations. And finally, if you condense all of that, this is what you will see. So this is the motion of one of these planets, in this case, Mars, um, as extracted from the observation of an astronomer, Tycho Brahe, and here recorded in the book by Kepler. You see it's doing very funny stuff. stuff. It's looping around, so there are these funny loops. And um, it's certainly regular to some degree, but it's not easy to interpret. And then you invest a lot of time and also get inspiration from another scientist who says, wait a moment, maybe things look more simple if we say that planets do not revolve around the earth, but planets revolve around the sun. And you try to test this hypothesis by doing hundreds and hundreds of pages of calculations. This is what Kepler did. And finally, after many false starts, you see, yes, indeed. If I assume they are moving around the sun, and so the Earth is also moving around the sun and things start to look complicated just because I'm looking at them from the moving Earth. If I assume all of this, then I can make sense of it and things become simple. 
So then I arrive at a model where the sun is in the focal point of an ellipse and the planet is moving around the ellipse and I can even say how fast the planets are moving around the ellipse. So that is a fine example of model building. You start from something that looks complicated. So a planet moving around these loopy trajectories. You have some idea, some vague guess that things could look simpler if I adopted a different viewpoint. And then you have to work out what would be the predictions and you have to adjust the model. You find it's not circles, but ellipses and you end up with something that is really, really much, much simpler. And then of course you can go on and wait 50 years and someone smart figures out, oh, I can simplify it further. I can just postulate that uh, F equals M times A and the force for planets is uh, going like one over R square. And then I will uh, find that these ellipses are a natural consequence of this even simpler law. So to summarize, if we build a model from observations, what do we wish for? Because what we wish for as a human scientist, that should eventually also be something that a computer scientist can do for us. And as we will see, it's not so easy. So first we want to build a model from relatively few observations. We call that data efficiency. Now it's true that of course, the number of observations for individual trajectories of the planets, that was quite large. But the number of planets, that was quite small. So you didn't have hundreds and hundreds of different planetary trajectories to work with. Uh, but still, given this relatively sparse data, uh, people like Kepler were able to make the right informed guesses. You also want to build a model that it likely generalizes well. So if this model is too fine-tuned, then that means maybe it just works for the five planetary trajectories you have observed. But once you go to the next planet, which you have not yet discovered, maybe it will fail. And it's a very difficult general question. How do you select models that they generalize well? So how do you... So next thing is, how do you come up with good guesses, good informed guesses? Experience shows people often use analogies. Uh, but again, this is a heuristic that is um, easy to state in words for humans, difficult to implement on the computer. You also want to focus on the most relevant features. So for example, in the observations, there were also the clouds, but you don't want to look at the clouds. In the observations, there were all the optical aberrations, uh, the distortions of the telescope. You want to understand that you should not focus on those. So you want to focus on the most relevant features, but then what defines relevant? That's an important question, not so easy. You maybe also want to focus on the most predictable features. I mean, you could have started with the ambitious goal that you want to predict everything that you can see on the night sky. But there were, as I said, there were the clouds and there were maybe birds flying there. These are not easily predictable. You have to understand that some things are more easily predictable. And then at least at first, maybe you want to focus on those. Okay, so build a model from the observations. The next thing is you want to test that model. Now testing the model can be Maybe there are additional observations you can do. In the simplest case, this just means you follow these trajectories of the planets for a few more years and see whether that fits your expectations from the model. Maybe eventually, 100 years have passed, uh, you figure out that uh, there are additional planets that you haven't seen before, and that's a good test of the model also. So these are observations. Sometimes you can even influence the observations. You cannot do that for planets. They're just there, but you could do well chosen experiments. Yeah, so on, on, on other things like the um, how objects move on the earth. Um, and so you can try to simplify the experiments as much as possible. Think hard about which aspects I can influence and think hard about what experiment uh, do you want to do right now in order to 
test your hypothesis in the best way possible. And also, even if you cannot have new observations or experiments at the given time, maybe you can still explore the consequences of your model in hypothetical situations. People call that Gedanken experiments. And it's very useful because um, from that you might learn whether there are already obvious, either con obvious contradictions to other models you have come up with, and then you have to decide which of the models you want to trust better. Or there are maybe very surprising results, results that look a little bit fishy. And then you can say, okay, let me do an experiment that goes into this regime and see whether the experiment really has the same surprising result. So all of that is good for testing models. Part of testing models is also that you understand what the model predicts in certain situations. And that means you want to be able to make efficient predictions. Now, it may not be so difficult if you just say, my model says that the planets move on ellipses, because I mean, an ellipse is a simple thing. Uh, but in many models that play a role in modern science, you have large numbers of variables, you have many, many electrons, or you want to resolve the uh, patterns of the fluid flow on many points of a grid. And so that becomes difficult. And for that purpose, you often need to invent approximations and then clever approximations, also invent clever effective models. So what is an effective model? It just means that maybe you even know the microscopic model, this is what you deduced from your observations, but to make efficient predictions at larger scales for more particles, uh, you want to derive another model that uh, is relevant if uh, you look at larger length scales or large time scales. And often this effective model can be, can look completely different. Maybe you wouldn't even see, you wouldn't be able to tell that it is related to this microscopic model. And sometimes, even if the microscopic model is known, the steps leading from such a microscopic model to such an effective model are so complicated that people actually still start to guess effective models at larger length scales in, in, in a smart way. So they are applying the same procedure they would apply if the microscopic model were not known. And so the question is, can a computer help us with these things? And at the moment, it only exists in very rudimentary forms. So these things are all only starting up right now and uh, it's quite difficult. So some of the questions uh, that come up in all of this context. So for example, you have several approximately valid models yeah, that kind of fit your data. How do you choose between them? And one choice is related to this desired ability to generalize well. So you want to guess which of these models is more likely to also work for new data that you haven't seen before. And there's a very old approach, or a very old philosophy that is called Occam's razor, which means you should prefer simple models because, and that is true, if a simple model fits the data very well, that means something usually. If a very complicated model fits the data very well, uh, maybe that's just because you had many fit parameters. So there is some truth to that, but how can one make this more precise? This will be one of the questions of this lecture series. Then there's the role of analytical expressions. So you are used to textbook physics or chemistry. There's lots and lots of analytical expressions, but is this because somehow nature for some reason likes um, fundamental models that uh, are described by analytical expressions? Or is this simply because we like models that are described by analytical expressions and this is the only thing we can deal with and so we focus on those. So it's a little bit unclear uh, at the moment how much uh, focus to put on analytical expressions. But now suppose you have built a powerful artificial scientist, um, then there comes in the human factor because the computer may generate lots of insights that are kind of new for the computer, but how can it understand which insights are already known to human scientists? In principle for that, it should 
have an overview of all of the scientific literature in the best case. Otherwise, it will be telling you a list of 100 things that it has discovered, and then you have to go through this list and figure out which of these things are really exciting and which are kind of um, a trivial consequence of known results. And then there's this other human factor coming into play. Namely, you want to be told about the insights of the computer. But the question is, how can the computer effectively communicate to you its insights so that uh, you don't need to spend time going through very complicated computer printouts, uh, but maybe the computer can become somewhat didactic and uh, telling you very efficiently about its insights. There's the other question, how can the computer effectively communicate its insights to other computers, to other machines? Uh, because at least initially we will have uh, many different artificial scientists, I suppose. And you also want to have this also, even just to be able to check results. Uh, so there should be a kind of format that you can exchange between different computers. Okay. So these, this is kind of the wish list of what we want to have, building models, testing models, making efficient predictions, all of this should eventually be able, uh, should be taken over by a computer. And so uh, to sum it all up, there should be a kind of cycle. Um, let's start at the top, there would be a hypothesis. Then you have to generate from this hypothesis, which is a model or a hypothesis maybe about the values of some parameters in the, a given model, you want to generate predictions. You want to see what are the consequences. And maybe you generate predictions for many different possible situations. And then you can figure out which of these situations is most specific to this particular model, to this particular hypothesis, as opposed to another model against which you want to distinguish this model. And so uh, what you can then try to do is you select the most informative experiment to test the particular hypothesis against another hypothesis so that you are economical in the experiments that you do because maybe each experiment costs a lot of time or effort. So then you do the experiment and then you obtain data, you obtain observations, you try to analyze these observations, again, something in which the computer should be helpful. And out of this analysis, you should be able to refine your hypothesis, or maybe you have to drop your hypothesis because it's clear it's not working. Maybe you're proposing a completely new hypothesis, and then the cycle starts again. So this is the dream artificial science uh, cycle, uh, but the question is how to make it work in practice. Yeah, so overall, if we can get a computer to generate insights to a considerable degree, maybe there's still some human input, but to a considerable degree, then we would start to speak of artificial scientific discovery. And I give here some examples uh, where people already derived such insights that were generated to a considerable degree by a computer. I like particularly the first one. The first one is the only of these examples that really implements the full loop so people have built a robot scientist, which is really a big lab apparatus in the field of functional genomics. So in this particular case, it was designed to figure out uh, what different genes and yeast cells do. So you switch on and off these genes and you grow the cells, you see what they do or don't do, or you test them. And each such experiment takes quite some time, maybe several hours or a day. Um, so you want to be economical about which experiments you're running. Uh, and then once you have the observations, the computer can draw conclusions from those, either discard some hypothesis or come up with a new hypothesis, assign probabilities to hypothesis, and select a new experiment that would be reasonable to do at this stage. And by now, this has been expanded. It's also done for drug screening. This has been done in the uh, group led by Ross King already for, for some time. And I will actually give links to the references on the course website. But there has also been progress in other domains. For example, take uh, quantum optics. So this is a nice example uh, that was uh, uh, invented by Mario Krenn, who is now here an 
independent research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. So several years ago, he came up with a computer tool to invent new quantum optics experiments. And so the tool was basically trying to optimize the output of these experiments so that it would produce more and more entangled states of photons. And when they looked very closely at the results, they identified interesting new components or combinations of components uh, that the computer had invented. And then finally, uh, protein folding again. So that uh, was a recent breakthrough by the DeepMind team um, who solved this very long-standing puzzle of if I give you the atoms in a protein and their sequence, how is the how does the structure look like in which the protein will fold eventually? It's a very difficult problem. And the progress here was so significant that other scientific groups then could immediately solve some uh, long-standing puzzles that they had had, but were not able to solve uh, before. So definitely some first examples of artificial scientific discovery, I would say. Now, at the moment, there are, these examples are still relatively domain specific. So they are specialized to a certain domain. They have been designed by experts. And also there's human input afterwards in the sense that the humans recognize, aha, this insight is not yet there in the scientific literature. And that's of course an important component of being able to claim a new insight. And so in the future, one would hope to be able to become more and more general, uh, less and less domain specific, and also thereby reduce the human input eventually. Okay. So a final remark in this direction. When uh, people talk about machine learning, of course, the, the visionary goal, the goal far in the future is general artificial intelligence. So you have a computer that can reason and think like a human uh, that can easily answer general question and understands the world. Um, an argument can be made that general artificial scientific discovery is a kind of subset of general artificial intelligence and it should be easier. It should be easier in particular because the fields of science we're talking about here often have a very strong quantitative component and also a strong component of logical reasoning. And so in these domains anyway, computers are very good. So if you build machine learning around that, you would think that computers have it easier to surpass the level of humans. And then of course, there's the promise of a direct interface that computers have between the more heuristic machine learning components and the direct numerical simulations or maybe interfaces to experiments. And so again, that should give them an, an obvious advantage. So for all of these reasons, we would think that general artificial scientific discovery should really be easier than general artificial intelligence, but it's still a challenge. And so that now brings me to what this lecture series is about. Uh, this lecture series uh, will not give you the artificial scientists. So we are not yet there. The field is just starting and maybe we are there in 10, 20 years. But this lecture series gives you a toolbox. It's the box of tools that we think at this point in time will probably play a role in the eventual artificial scientists. And so you can start building them. There's no guarantee, of course, maybe in 10 years, we look back and we say, oh, some of these pieces were not needed. Some of them are more important than it seems at this point. Maybe there would be other pieces that are even more important that I do not list here. But uh, these aspects that I list here are reasonably good guess. So uh, let me go through them quickly. But this is basically the table of contents. We will certainly go through artificial neural networks as a building block uh, for machine learning. That's how I view them. We will talk about statistics, about how the Bayes theorem is in principle the best way to update your information about the world. We will say more general things about information theory. How can you quantify the amount of information contained in something. Uh, we will talk about so-called representation learning. So how can you extract the essence of data just from the observations? 
we will talk about learning probability distributions. So um, you just observe, you sample things, and you learn indirectly by a neural network the observed probability distribution. We will uh, then come back to neural networks, talk about more advanced structures that exploit some uh, symmetries of the data, for example, translational symmetry or permutational symmetry uh, that will lead to things like graph networks or uh, attention mechanisms. Um, we will then talk about discovering strategies. So that's the domain of reinforcement learning. And we will go to the more advanced uh, aspects of reinforcement learning. We will talk about adaptive observations. So um, if I'm able to choose what is the observation or experiment that I'm going to do in the next step, how can I optimize this in order to get the maximum amount of information? Um, and we will talk about measuring complexity. So um, uh, if I make a model, uh, is it a simple model? Is it a complex, maybe overly complex model? When I observe data, are they rather simple or complex? How do I uh, know this? So this is an important part. Okay. So any questions so far about the overview or the introduction, because otherwise I would uh, start with the real lectures. Um, yeah, so there's one comment, unfortunately, again, by direct message. So please send it to everyone. But the comment is, I think building general artificial intelligence is not even reasonable at this time, since computational resources are limited. Uh, that's probably true. So at least what we cannot do is uh, take the algorithms that exist now and our present day knowledge and just put a really large model on the computer with billions of parameters and train like crazy and then hope that magically general artificial intelligence uh, will arise. There's a little bit what they try to do with these very large uh, uh, language models like the GPT-3. So this is basically where they invested <laughs> largest amount of resources and I think they spend millions of dollars um, just to get it trained um, and obviously it is not a generally artificially intelligent system it can produce sentences that kind of sound reasonable but it has no understanding of the world so we are still very far from that and I agree that one should probably approach this rather stepwise and uh, not think there's some magic thing that I can now do and just learn it run for half a year and then automatically it will become great. There's another quick question that's more organization. Can we get to do a mini project for this course too? Yes, I mentioned in the beginning. So international students who are not part of the Friedrich Alexander University, you can get a certificate at the very end of the course. Um, I will say more about that on the website and in the discussion group. So we don't need to spend time on it now. Uh, there's another um, remark. Some of these elements that you mentioned imply philosophical issues. Yes, uh, that is certainly true. Um, so from my, I have a more pragmatic approach. Um, I try to avoid those issues that get too philosophical because sometimes maybe it's then more a discussion about language. Uh, so then I, I try to avoid those a little bit uh, just to be efficient. But yes, uh, much of this will eventually um, become important philosophically, I guess. Um, okay, there's another question. Will this lecture introduce some examples of machine learning on condensed metaphysics, such as mass materials design and so on? Um, I will probably uh, mention them, but we have so much interesting uh, concepts and material to go through that I will probably not be able to spend a lot of time on specific examples. But I can invite everyone who wants to do a mini project <laughs> actually to do maybe a mini project trying, say, to adapt something that was presented in the literature and simplify it uh, to a smaller example. And then uh, we could all hear about it when you present it in the end. So there's another question. Um, oh, there are complexity classes in computer science. Yes. I think there are some work suggesting scientific discovery is NP hard. Um, yes, okay. So 
So the problem is then whenever you say something is NP hard, it depends extremely on how you exactly you formulate the task. And so I'm assuming these results, which I do not know the details of, uh, come about if you say, I want to have guaranteed the absolute optimum of say, doing the optimum of these adaptive observations, and then uh, in a high dimensional space and so on. So it depends a little bit on how you, um, and on how you phrase it. And then you can, uh, in my experience, very quickly come up uh, with uh, statements like, okay, this is NP hard and so on. But uh, the question you really have to ask yourself, okay, but does it matter in practice? Maybe I'm, as, as you implied yourself, maybe I'm happy with, uh, with an approximate answer and so on. Uh, obviously, humans are doing scientific discovery um, and we are not uh, suddenly frozen just because uh, some uh, idealized version of it uh, is NP hard. So that would be my take on it. But it will certainly be difficult, yeah? I mean, really good uh, scientific human discovery is also only, um, so the big breakthroughs uh, do not come very often. That is also true. Are we going to deal with general PDE? I assume by that you mean uh, partial differential equations. And uh, yes, uh, so wave equations, evolution, nonlinear wave evolution, that will be part of the examples that we are interested in. And extracting dynamical loss from observations, absolutely, this is something that we will be interested in. Um, there have been some work on describing functioning of neural networks using methods of statistical physics. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, I plan to have I plan to have a little bit on this, so to speak, the theory of learning in neural networks, maybe even uh, so what I'm particularly interested in, what it can tell us for for our practice of applying neural networks. Um, and so this brings me to another piece that I want to mention about the structure of these lectures. So these lectures are a little designed like a spiral. So what I mean by that, is that we will have artificial neural networks, the basics, and then later we will have artificial neural networks, some more advanced structures, and then even later we will have artificial neural networks, uh, theory of learning. And similarly, we will have information theory, the basics, information theory, some, something more advanced and so on. So we will uh, return and again and again to the same kinds of concept areas, and then uh, look at them in a more advanced way. So this is uh, something we will be doing, yes. Okay, whether the lecture slides will be available on the course website. Yes, I will make them available uh, from experience. I know that sometimes I'm lagging a little bit behind. So what is guaranteed to be on the YouTube channel is of course the recordings, but I understand that it's very useful to have the slides. So. If I forget to put them up, you just remind me and then I will put them up. Okay, so let's get started. So, yeah, I want to defer the more precise questions maybe to later. Um, I do believe that uh, people have already used uh, neural networks, certainly to speed up hydrodynamic simulations. And so that immediately uh, will be important for other aspects like climate change uh, simulation studies. Um, but I, I'm not familiar with the literature on that. Maybe you want to explore the literature and then tell us about it in the discussion group, and then we can comment on it. And I wouldn't set uh, my hopes too high in the field of quantum machine learning at the moment. I think that is still in its infancy. So I think quantum, uh, classical machine learning is already uh, difficult enough. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, we still have uh, 25 minutes for today. Um, artificial neural networks, just the basics. Uh, I know that some of you have listened to my uh, previous lecture. So for you, this will be to some degree repetition, but never mind. It's a new angle at least. And so let's get started by the motivation. So um, the way I think about neural networks from a higher level perspective is that Yes, there's the internal structure of a neural network and how you train it and so on. But you can also, from a higher level perspective, consider it as just a building block. So there is the neural network. Sometimes you want to look at the internals and how you train it. 
but essentially it's just a building block. It's a learnable function. And why is this way of looking at it so useful? So let me, uh, let me sketch a few things. So uh, in this way of looking at things, of course, uh, if I look at a single neural network, then it's just a single function. So I have my input X, it's uh, being fed through a neural network. I call it F, a function F. Uh, and then I get an output y equals f of x. And that covers a lot of uh, situations. For example, x could be an image, the output could be a label, x could be a voltage trace in an experiment, the output could be the inferred state of your qubit and so on. So that already covers lots and lots of different things. But then there are more advanced situations where you want more uh, than one function conceptually. Uh, one important um, case is representation learning. So what does that mean? You want to feed in your input into one neural network that you will call the encoder, and it will spit out uh, some uh, representation of the input here called Z, which typically is of a lower dimension. So if X has dimension 1000, Z has dimension 10, for example. So think of it as a compressed representation. And then you would take this compressed representation and take it and run it through what is called a decoder. So that's another neural network. And then hopefully you get something, uh, that's the idea behind autoencoders, that is as close as possible to the input, even though you ran it through such uh, bottlenecks, through such a compressed representation. So already here it's better to think of two neural networks even though the whole thing, of course, is also a neural network, as sometimes you will be interested in the intermediate results. So that's why it's good to conceptually split it apart. You might be interested in a time series. So um, here's the input at some point in time. Here's the corresponding output. But that, then there is another point in time, uh, number one, and again, there's input and output. But maybe I want to process each point in time in the same manner. So that would always be applying the same neural network. And maybe in addition, I want to be smart. I want to say, huh, I want to keep some memory. So the F could have as output, not only this uh, actual output, Y, but it could have as output something that serves as memory and is being fed into the next a neural network. And then you can feed it uh, through in time, propagating forward in time. So you would feed through the memory. And again, this is a situation where it's good uh, to think of the neural network as the building block. So at each time you use, in this case, even the same neural network, because you say all times are kind of the same. There's translational invariance in time. There's no reason to use a different neural network. There will still be interesting time dependence that comes about implicitly because as the memory builds up, of course, the uh, input to the third F here, to the third application, will be different than the input uh, for the initial application. Uh, so automatically, things become more interesting. You could have something like this. You could have an image as an input to some neural network. Maybe independently, you have some text that represents a question you ask about this image. And you will process first the image and the text separately. Maybe the text is processed by some one of these big neural networks that are very good at processing text. The image is uh, processed by a neural network that has been pre-trained on many images. And eventually, they produce representations of the image and of the text. And you will then feed uh, these representations into a final neural network that combines them and then does something with them. And if this text down here represented a question about the image, maybe the final output will be the answer to this question about the image. So again, it's better than to think of the individual neural networks and treat them as building blocks. And there are many uh, different situations. One famous one that I can mention here is this. Um, let's say uh, Z is just some noisy input. And the purpose of uh, the network G is to generate out of this noisy input some interesting looking image. And then there will be another network 
D, into which you can feed either this uh, generated image or maybe a real image from the real world. And it is supposed to tell me uh, whether uh, it is looking at the real image or this fake image. So that's a discriminator and the whole approach uh, is called generative adversarial networks. So in all these situations, it's good to think of not only a single neural network, but the neural network becomes a building block in a more complicated structure. And there are many, many more examples. And so this is uh, something that I wanted to say uh, in advance. Okay. Now, the point is, of course, that these functions, you do not define them. They are learnable. They are trainable. And uh, that brings us to the domain of function approximation. So we would have an input x. We would apply a function to this input. But this function, we want to be able to change because we want to be able to improve it according to our experience during the learning process. So this function will then also depend on parameters. And the standard notation in this whole domain of machine learning is that the collection of all parameters will be called theta. So this theta is really a vector. It may be a million different parameters combi combined in this vector. So these are the parameters and that's the input. And then of course I get my output. So all of these are typically higher dimensional things. There may be the input has dx dimensions, the parameters have d theta dimensions, and the output has dy dimensions. And the goal of all of this is, of course, that I want to approximate as closely as possible some given function. So that's what I imply here. And this given function we might call the target function. Sometimes this target function may in principle be explicitly known because maybe it is the result of a simulation and in principle, you know the algorithm that is being run by the simulation. It may only be a little bit uh, um, resource intensive to obtain the result of this uh, calculation. Uh, sometimes this function is not really known. You just assume that there is such a function in principle and then an, observations in nature provide you a few data points on this function. So for specific inputs, you get the output. Okay, anyway. So this is a function approximation. We now just want to adapt the parameters in order to uh, get a good approximation. So let's look at this in a very simple example. For now, to keep it simple and so that I can draw things, I will just imagine things to be low dimensional. So X and Y just will be one dimensional. And so I can draw the situation that I have in mind. This is Y versus X. And I could draw my uh, function, my function that I want to fit. Let's uh, put it in orange. It's this, um, kind of Lorentzian line shape uh, it could happen that you look at a spectrum and this is what you what you get. Now the um, function that I try to fit to it, maybe it's not yet perfect, so it looks not so good. So that is the function that I want to fit f theta of x. And the goal is uh, to, to make f theta of x as close as possible to f of x. Okay. Um, now I have to be a little bit more specific what I mean when I say cl as close as possible. And the natural uh, thing to do here would be to define some distance between the two functions. And just to pick the simplest example, we could take the quadratic deviation and integrate over the full interval. So that's just an example to keep things concrete. So take the quadratic deviation and minimize this. Now, what are the options for me? The options of making an ansatz uh, for the approximation. Well, so 
people suddenly didn't start with neural networks. And if you don't know anything about the particular physical situation, uh, something that people have done suddenly in the past is just a polynomial fit. So F theta is just a sum of terms. Let's call the coefficients theta n, x to the n. And in order to keep a finite number of terms, we may run the sum only up to capital N. So that's a choice that's sometimes reasonable. We could also do a Fourier transform. So we would say F theta now is a sum over different terms. Let me call the coefficients theta k and then e to the i kx. Now here, in order to have a finite number of terms, maybe I want to implement a cutoff. So the allowed k values are always smaller than some capital K, which just means the wavelengths cannot be too short. Uh, and also uh, anyone who's ever done a Fourier series on a finite length interval also knows that there is already a finite spacing uh, between the different k values. So if I impose also an upper cutoff, there will be a finite number of terms. And we can generalize this, of course. So what we are seeing in these examples is we always have in these examples a linear superposition. So it's linear in the coefficients. Um, of nonlinear functions of x. So x to the n and e to the ikx, these are nonlinear functions. So in general, I, if I like to write this in general, I would say f theta of x is uh, a sum over n theta n and then some function phi n of x. These were the monomials x to the n or the um, plane waves e to the i k x. Now, if I insert any such ansatz into the quadratic deviation that I showed before, and I carry out the minimization, it turns out since the ansatz is linear in the coefficients, uh, the thing that I want to minimize will be quadratic in the coefficients. And this will immediately lead me um, to a linear algebra problem. So minimization of square deviation immediately leads me to linear algebra problems. And this is, of course, uh, super easy to solve. Um, in some special cases, it's even easier. You know that for the Fourier transform, I don't need to invert any matrix or do anything. I just can directly calculate the Fourier coefficients. And that's also true more generally, of course, as you know, if the phi n are an autonormal basis, uh, because then I can just calculate the overlaps. So you know maybe from quantum physics that I would take the function that I want to approximate, I uh, project it onto my basis, and uh, these are then the coefficients that I will need. So all of this is nice and uh, fine. And in particular, it's powerful because um, in all of these cases that I discussed now, I can make sure that I can represent an arbitrary function. Uh, namely, in all of these cases, I can say, if I let the number of terms go to infinity, so more and more uh, higher and higher order polynomials or uh, k, uh, can take arbitrary values, um, then I can make sure that under reasonable conditions, I can approximate my desired target function arbitrarily well. Of course, um, mathematically inclined people know that um, my target function needs to be sufficiently smooth. And then I also have to specify uh, what this um, convergence really means with respect to which measure of deviation and so on. So these are all the details, but uh, generally speaking, if I let the terms, uh, the number of terms go to infinity, I can approximate arbitrary functions. And this is very important, yeah? I could have been unlucky if I make a bad ansatz, this need not be the case. So what the general term here is, is that I have um, expressiveness. So I can express or approximate, at least in this limit, um, arbitrary functions. 
And if you want to invent uh, other general methods of approximating functions, this is something you want to strive for. Okay, but the question that we do have to ask is, it may be expressive, but is it efficient? So in terms of the number of coefficients or the number of terms you need, are you efficiently compressing your initial function or is it uh, really bad in this respect? And that's where it gets more interesting. Um, so let's uh, look at the Fourier approximation. So I have this um, Lorentzian line shape, let's say, on some interval. The width, uh, let's say, is delta x. And uh, if you have ever done Fourier transformations, you know automatically there is this inverse relation between the width in Fourier space and the width in real space. In physics, it's called the uncertainty relation. And so what that means is if I were now to plot the Fourier coefficients, so theta k squared against k, again, if I Fourier transform that something that looks like a Gaussian, I will again get a Gaussian. But the width of this, of course, is delta k. Now, we already knew that on a finite interval, I get um, only a discrete letters of allowed k. So what that ends up with meaning is that if I only count the Fourier coefficients that are kind of non-zero, so only in the delta k interval, I will need a number of Fourier coefficients that goes like L over delta x. So if delta x is a fraction of one over 30, I will need on the order of 30 Fourier coefficients. And so this, um, Maybe okay if delta x spans almost the whole interval, but it certainly gets very bad if you have a very, very narrow peak. If I have a very narrow peak, maybe it would have been more, um, so this was Fourier. It would have been more efficient with a narrow peak to live on a grid. So I could say, aha, uh -huh, again, this is x. I have a very fine grid. I have a narrow peak. And maybe I store only these values where um, I'm basically non-zero on the grid. Now, um, that's good for a narrow peak, but in general, of course, how many um, points do I need to store? Well, I need delta x divided by a, where a is the lattice spacing. So I need that many grid points. And so you now see there's a kind of reciprocal relation uh, in Fourier, uh, if, you, if you express things in Fourier space, it's better to have a very wide peak. If you express it in, uh, on grid space, it's better to have a narrow peak. But regardless of which of these two methods I will choose, there will always be functions where I will not be doing well, even though they look extremely simple. It's just this little bump that I want to approximate. Now, people, of course, know a far, far better approach. And I don't know whether you want to think of it for a moment. If I have this function, and I want to approximate it in a smart way, how should I do it? Think of the grid, maybe. Um, maybe think of a different kind of grid. Anyone has any idea? Okay. So what about I draw this? So pick one point here, pick one point there, pick one point here and here and here, and then I connect them. So what I have done here is really, I've done an adaptive grid. And of course, in many computer simulation frameworks, 
this is one of the most important components that you can do an adaptive grid or an adaptive mesh so you get more resolution where it matters and so on now of course here you also need to store a little bit more so for each of these points now you need to store both the location along the x direction and the location along the y direction so okay but still it's much much more efficient and so one of the things that i want to point out now already anticipating what we will discuss that a neural network can do exactly this so if you apply a neural network to a 1d situation it will do this kind of thing So it will be smarter than both the Fourier transform and smarter than the regular grid. In fact, this is not just something that will work somewhat like this adaptive grid, but this piecewise linear approximation is exactly what you get if you have a certain type of neural network and we will discuss this later. So it's very, very simple and immediately you get this adaptive um, behavior. Okay, so, the, but this is only one aspect of what neural networks will do. Coming back to another option. So if you start fitting functions um, like this one, another option would be just to have an ansatz because maybe you have some physical insight. Maybe you know, aha, this is a spectrum. So you say, my ansatz is the Lorentzian. So you want something like one plus the square of something that would be an amplitude. Let me call this theta zero. So theta again are our parameters. And then I would maybe subtract theta one, that would be the location, would become the location of my peak and divide by theta two, that would become the width of the peak. And so if that is really true, then of course this ansatz is the best thing I can ever do. I just now need to find these um, coefficients. Note that these coefficients, these uh, parameters theta, enter in a nonlinear way. That's different from the Fourier series and so on. So now they enter in a nonlinear way. The problem with this is, of course, I need some prior knowledge and it's not easy to generalize. You can generalize in some modest way for example if you say oh but i will have a spectrum with several such peaks then of course you can take a sum over such contributions uh, but this is not easily generalized however there is some lesson that we can learn from this ansatz and uh, the lesson that we learn from this ansatz i would say is that such a symbolic expression typically has a hierarchical structure a recursive structure So um, what that means is I just calculate, say, first the terms inside the square, then I add the one, then I do the division, and so on. This is the way the computer actually um, uh, carries out the calculation, right? And so just a quick aside, the general way to represent such a uh, hierarchical structure is in terms of a tree. So you would say, aha, uh -huh, I take the difference between x and theta one, so here, this represents taking the difference between them. Uh, then whatever is the result that will be carried along this line, I divide it by theta two. So let me say, this is the symbol for division. And then I add the one. And then I finally uh, take all of this and take theta zero and divide theta zero by all of this. And the outcome will be um, the result of my calculation. So these symbolic expression trees are very important in, well, in say symbolic computer algebra programs to, to store internally the actual analytical expressions. In principle, you can also try to fit using such symbolic expression trees you just try out many trees and then in these trees there are a few continuous parameters and you want to fit these parameters but it's a little bit difficult because um, these trees are the structure of these trees is discrete so either there is a new branch or there is not a new branch or there is this function or it isn't and so to even walk through all possible expression trees is a little bit tricky 
So it's not an easily generalized method. And in particular, it doesn't go together well with another important ingredient that we will learn to use later, namely gradient descent, because you may still apply gradient descent to these parameters, but you certainly cannot apply it to the discrete structure of the tree. And so that's why we at the moment don't really uh, continue further with uh, trees, but we can learn from it. Um, oh, someone told me I missed something. Haha, -ha. I missed the square that is true. So, um, so I divide it and then before I add, right, uh, that's, yeah, that's true. Should be able to move this. Uh, and the square operation is interesting because it's a, it has not two operands, but a single operand. So maybe I say this is my square operation. I feed this in and then, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so we can learn from that the general idea. And this is how I finished today. So we learn the general idea of using a recursive ansatz. So we would say our, my f theta of x is no longer simply a sum of terms as it was for the Fourier transform and the polynomials and so on. But it's really something where I first apply some function f1 with parameters theta one, that's still a vector to the input. And then whatever results I stick into another function f2 that depends on parameters theta two. And then the result I stick into another function f3 with parameters theta three, and maybe then it goes on. So I have a recursive setting and uh, remember that each of these functions can really output a full vector, not necessarily a scalar. So I'm pretty, um, pretty general when I make this ansatz. And the hope is then that such a recursive expression can be more efficient in certain situations. It is certainly efficient in situations that have the structure of the symbolic expression that we started with. And also when I, for example, transform the input, because someone might say, okay, if X here is the frequency, but I wanted to express my spectrum in terms of the wavelength lambda, then I should insert the frequency being equal to one over lambda, right? So I have transformed my input, so this tree would grow and if I want to fit this efficiently, maybe it's good that the uh, structure of my ansatz is already recursive, and then it's very easy to, uh, to take care of this. Yeah. So this will be the general idea that we will use uh, for neural networks. And um, maybe then to finish off for today, uh, here's a little wish list. What do we wish for when we want to produce such a general function approximator? We want to have simple building blocks. We want it to be general, so easily scaled up. If I want to use more parameters and get a better approximation, it should be fairly simple to see how this is done. We should be able to approximate any function eventually if we use sufficiently many parameters. That's certainly something we want. But we also want the approximation to be efficient. Now that will depend on the kind of examples you're looking at, but we have a feeling that uh, being recursive may help with that. We also want it to work well for high dimensions. So high dimensions in the input, high dimensions in the output. And it should be able to learn efficiently to find the right parameters that should also be efficient uh, because otherwise it's not helpful. And so the, the, the point, uh, and that's where we really end for today, is uh, that the answer to all of these wishes on the wish list is artificial neural networks. And that's where we will continue on Wednesday. Okay, are there any questions at the moment? Okay, so first question, when I define my grid, yes, here. The adaptive grid methods can have different point separation. Yes, absolutely. So this uh, separation is completely different from this separation, and that's the uh, reason why it becomes efficient. I don't understand the last question. Must it be a concatenation of regions? Um, so these are just intervals of different uh, width 
de facto. So I hope this answered the question. So absolutely the different uh, points of different separations. Any more questions? So the method made all at once. Uh, okay, I didn't talk about how these points would be found. Um, I can certainly make a direct ansatz like this and then do gradient descent uh, for neural networks. This looks uh, slightly differently. Um, and I will typically need, that's a good question. So I, I believe for, at least for 1D, there's certainly methods where I would be able uh, to do the adaptive grid in a single go. So I, um, I could go from left to right and always look at um, what's the curvature because that matters, right? If I do piecewise linear approximation and I have the zero curvature, it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> And the only reason why I need extra points is that there is curvature. And so I would then just adjust the density of points according to the local curvature. So that would be a simple method without any global uh, overview of the problem, just to say, oh, my density of points uh, is adjusted according to the curvature. Uh, uh, expressivity just means that I have an ansatz um, for a function approximator and I ask myself, can I approximate arbitrary functions? So then more specifically, typically I need to let the a number of terms go to infinity uh, and then ask whether I can approximate better and better and better. So it just is the question, what is the range of function that I can approximate by my particular ansatz f theta of x? Okay. Isn't your recursive construction a special case of nonlinear structure? Yes, absolutely. So this, as we see, um, this f theta of x ansatz here, but also this, these will be um, both nonlinear in x and also nonlinear in the parameters in the end. Because even if the theta parameters would enter linearly here, maybe this is a Fourier series, the first function, uh, I will still insert it then into as an argument into the F2 function, and there it will be um, uh, distorted in a nonlinear way. So in the end, the whole dependence on uh, the theta parameters will be nonlinear. Uh, there's a question, is unsupervised learning be covered? Absolutely. So uh, representation learning is the uh, prime example of unsupervised learning. Okay, so if there are no more questions for today, I would say that's good enough. You know, know where the lecture is going and I hope to see you again on Wednesday, same time. Thank you. <laughs>